Hello and uh, welcome to today's Great Plains and Midwest Climate Outlook for this 18th of December 2014. Today uh, we're closing the year with uh, Wendy Ryan, Assistant State Climatologist at Colorado State University. And without further ado, Wendy, it's all yours. Okay, thank you John and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, just showing a picture there from beautiful Steamboat Springs, Colorado in November. Um, thanks to all the partners that make these webinars uh, possible, uh, NOAA, the National Drought Mitigation Center, Regional Climate Centers, and the American Association of State Climatologists. Uh, just a little bit of general information here about the webinars. You can see the different uh, people helping to contribute to these, uh, Dennis Toddy, Doug Cluck, John Eyes, uh, the State Climatologist and the Midwest Regional Climate Center, the High Plains Regional Climate Center, the Climate Prediction Center, Iowa State University and the National Drought Mitigation Center. The next webinar, which will start the webinar series for 2015, will be Jim Angel, the Illinois State Climatologist, and that is scheduled for January 15th. And one note about the webinar series next year, it will be a single URL sign up. So when you sign up in January, you will be automatically signed up for the rest of the webinars for the year um, through December. So if you sign up in May, you'll be signed up for all the webinars from May through December. So just a little note about that. And you can find all of the past recorded presentations on these links that are provided here. Um, and these are available online. And we'll have questions at the end. So we'll just get started here, talk about the agenda. We'll talk about current conditions across the region, uh, looking at temperature, precipitation, snowpack, soil moisture some impacts from the current conditions on the region, and then we'll look at uh, the outlooks going forward for temperature and precipitation. So we'll start here looking at the month-to-date or temperature departure from normal graphics for the region, so starting December 1st and going through the 15th. And you can see very different conditions than what we experienced in November. You can see very warm conditions predominating over the western portion of the region, particularly Wyoming and Colorado where we've got temperatures 6 to 15 degrees above average for the start of December. Um, as you go east, temperatures moderated a little bit, but still much above average through the Dakotas down to Kansas. And then once you get into the eastern portion of the region, just 0 to 3 degrees above average for the start of December, and actually a little bit cooler than average uh, over the upper peninsula of Michigan and northern Wisconsin. If we look at the 30-day temperature departure, so this is taking into account some of that cold November weather that we had, you can see the western portion of the region still quite warm, uh, particularly over southern Wyoming where they were <coughs> anywhere from 4 to 10 degrees above average over the 30-day period. Uh, Colorado also very warm in that 2 to 8 degrees above average for the 30-day period. Cooled off a little bit as you went east, uh, picking up some of those November cold temperatures where much of the, the eastern part of the region was below average for the 30-day period, anywhere from zero to 8 degrees below normal for the 30-day period, particularly over northern Michigan there. These are the statewide average temperature ranks uh, for, November, for the full month of November. Um, and you can see the cooler colors mean it was colder than normal. Warmer colors mean it was warmer than average. But you can see the eastern portion of the region really in their top 10 coolest Novembers on record going back to 1895. As we move west, uh, those moderated a little bit. You can see Colorado right near average at the 48th rank. Um, but as farther west you went, even California in their top 10 warmest. So big discrepancy from east to west across the U.S. there. But really just looking at those cold temperatures for November over much of the Great Lakes and Midwest region. If we look at the calendar year through November, so this is looking at temperature from January through November 2014. Again, you see the eastern portion, portion of the central region, many of those states in their top 10 coldest, so much, much below average uh, for the calendar year temperatures. Still below average from the Dakotas south to Kansas, and then big split right there um, at Colorado and Wyoming where we were in our uh, above average categories, uh, much different than the eastern portion of the region so far for the calendar year. <clears throat> Switch gears here and look a little bit at precipitation. So the 30-day precipitation percent of average is there on the left. And then I've included the water year there on the right, which goes back to October 1st. So for the 30-day period, you can see dry conditions predominating much of the northern portion of the region. Um, spotty high amounts of precipitation over the 30-day period over northern Wyoming and southeastern Colorado. 
um, and you can kind of see that storm track march across the, the region there uh, through Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio, where they had right around normal uh, through that storm track there, but north of there, very dry, uh, less than 75% of normal over much of the region. Uh, the one re part of the area is uh, Michigan there, where they're a little bit closer to normal over the northern portion of the state. If we go back to October 1st for the water year precipitation, again, you see this dry pattern uh, that has persisted since the beginning of the water year. The Dakotas, Minnesota, down into Nebraska and Kansas, very dry, less than 70% of normal precipitation over much of that region. We see some spotty high amounts through uh, Montana, Wyoming, and Colorado, and then again through Kansas and into Missouri, um, but the rest of the region fairly dry. Uh, the upper peninsula of Michigan and northern Michigan there, you can see above average uh, since the beginning of the water year, but just a very small portion of the region there. <coughs> the statewide precipitation ranks are included in this graphic for November. So again, the driest on record are the, the browner colors and wettest are the bluer colors. So you can see those dry conditions uh, in that below average category predominating much of the region. You can see that Michigan, as I just showed, is in their above average category as are Montana and Wyoming. And then the Dakota is Colorado and Indiana and Wisconsin right in their near average range, but the rest of the region uh, below average for November precipitation. If, again, we look at the calendar year through November precipitation ranks, it looks a little bit different when you look at the full calendar year. We're in our top 10 wettest um, in Wisconsin and Michigan, really much above average and above average over the northern portion of the region. So as you go south, we dried out a little bit. Uh, normal conditions from Colorado clear over to Ohio, but then once you get farther south, we're in that below average category for calendar year precipitation through November. This is the current modeled snow depth <clears throat> for the region. You can see some good coverage. We actually have snow cover uh, mainly from this week in these southern areas over Nebraska, Kansas, and eastern Colorado, uh, but note the lack of snow cover over the northern portion of the region. The next graphic here is just going to show our anomalies. So you can see the yellow colors are below average. Um, or they should have more snow on the ground than they currently do over the Dakotas, Minnesota, over to Wisconsin and Michigan. And then again, like I just said, the, the storm that came this week and brought some snow to the eastern plains of Colorado, Nebraska, Kansas is actually a positive anomaly. Uh, but this lack of snow cover over the northern portion of the region is concerning uh, for several reasons, and we'll talk about that a little bit. And you can see even the, the Rockies uh, through Colorado up into Montana actually showing a bit of a, a negative anomaly as well in terms of snow on the ground at this point uh, for December 18th. This is the Westwide Snowtail current snow water equivalent percent of normal, and this is really just looking at the high elevation locations, that mountain snowpack, um, and characterizing it for the basins. You can see from Montana and the northern portion of Wyoming, we're doing pretty good, really close to normal for where snow water equivalent on the ground should be this time of year. One dry basin there in northeastern Wyoming. And then as we go farther south, the basins dry out a little bit. We're more into that 70 to 90 percent of normal range um, over southeastern Wyoming and much of Colorado. Um, the Arkansas Basin in Colorado doing the best currently at 90 percent. Um, and then the western slope also looking a little bit dry in Colorado. Uh, this is looking at the snowpack in the Missouri River Basin. So on the left, we've got snowpack above Fort Peck. And then on the right, we've got snow below for Peck down to Garrison. So you can see the way these graphics are set up. We've got the normal there in the red line. The current year is filled in blue. We've got a low year of 2001 in green, and then two high years for comparison, 1997 and 2011 there on the top. And currently, at Fort, above Fort Peck, you can see we're 85 percent of normal, so just slightly below where we should be at this time of year in the snow accumulation season. And then from Fort Peck down to Garrison, they're at 90 percent of normal, so just slightly below where they should be um, in snowpack currently. This is modeled soil moisture from the NLDAS uh, system. This is, uh, used, this is shown as a percentile ranking. So uh, you know, the lower the percentile ranking, zero is your lowest year on record, driest in this case. 100 would be your wettest on record for the date. And then the 50th percentile would be your median. So we can see the western portion of the region dominated by wet, wetter than normal soils particularly over central Montana. 
as we go east, that dries out considerably, particularly over Minnesota and Ohio, and then the, the connecting area between there. Um, the normal conditions kind of show where we saw that storm track move through um, earlier this month. So some normal conditions, but definitely the eastern portion of the region is predominant um, at, with the soil moisture percentiles less than the 30th. Um, so starting to see some of those, those drought concerns pop up. This is the current Great Lakes ice cover graphic from the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab and the National Ice Center. You can see that the Great Lakes are only 1.2% ice covered. Uh, last month, Dennis talked about how we had an early onset of ice uh, into the Great Lakes, but this is a little bit below average on where the ice cover should be at this time of year, which is about 10%. Um, so that's where we are currently on ice cover on the Great Lakes. Let's talk about some of the issues around the region. So after that cold November, we had some concerns about ice jams on some rivers. Um, that is really kind of subsided with the warm and dry conditions at, with the start of de December. And it also allowed for some of the harvest to finish up getting those drier, warmer conditions. The lack of snow that I showed over the northern portion of the region is of concern. Uh, lack of snow and dry soil moisture tends to lead to warmer than normal winters. Um, if you don't have the snow on the ground uh, to reflect that solar radiation away, the ground starts to absorb it and you get a little bit warmer. Potential winter wheat damage or loss is a concern when you don't have snow on the ground to protect it from cold temperatures and wind, uh, especially when you get into the, the windy winter months here. And winter recreation impacts are starting to be felt around the Black Hills area. Uh, ski areas can make snow, but snowmobiling, cross-country, winter recreation, that type of stuff depends on Mother Nature to bring that snow, and it's currently lacking in that region. So just starting to feel some of the impacts to recreation up there. And then we also had a rare December tornado this week in Kansas um, that was only one of six since 1950 recorded in Kansas. Talk a little bit more about agricultural impacts here uh, and talk about the harvest. The corn harvest is only at 94% and we'll probably won't see an update on these numbers until spring. Um, some of the corn was left unharvested in the fields over the northern states and that was due to a variety of factors. Uh, late planting in the spring because of cold weather de delayed the, the crop development from the, the, the get-go there. Um, then the cooler, wetter growing season delayed growth a little bit, so they were leaving corn in the field to try to mature and dry out, and then they got some November snow, so some areas were having some trouble getting in to get that corn harvested. Uh, as of December 14th, Wisconsin was only 91% harvested in corn, and Michigan only 80% as of December 1st were two updated numbers that I had. The soybean harvest is 97% complete, sorghum 91% complete, sunflower is 86% complete. Uh, moving on to winter wheat is nationally 92% emerged. 37% um, of the wheat growing areas in the region are experiencing drought, and that's mainly over uh, Kansas and southern Colorado. And the late planting and cold November impacts uh, may have had an effect on the winter wheat crop, um, but we won't really know that until it can be assessed in the spring. Here's a graphic showing the U.S. corn progress. Just note that this is from November 23rd. It's, it's the last update that we had. You can see the western portion of the region doing much better than the eastern portion of the region where you see those lower percentages, particularly over Wisconsin and Michigan. Again, those numbers came up a little bit, um, but still below average on their harvest up there. Winter wheat progress, so as of November 23rd, you can see the percent emergence at, um, in these states. Again, the west portion of the region looking okay, but farther east where the cold snap really hit, um, you can see that it stopped the emergence of winter wheat kind of in its tracks. Um, so again, that'll need to be assessed in the spring what the full impact of that cold temperatures in November were. This is the current U.S. drought monitor for the U.S. Uh, you can see Southern Colorado and Kansas are really the two areas of concern right now in terms of drought. We still have extreme drought uh, present in southwestern Kansas. We have had some introduction of drought over the past month. This next graphic shows the changes. So the yellow is a degradation, gray is no change, and green is improvements. So you can see over southern Nebraska, northern Kansas, we have had some degradation, one class degradation, as well as over the Dakotas. Uh, in Minnesota over the northern portion there, also one class degradation over the month. 
So now we'll switch gears a little bit from current conditions and talk about the climate outlooks and forecasts. Uh, so first, I've got the seven-day quantitative precipitation forecast up there, and you can see uh, quite optimistic amounts over the Rockies. Um, if you're into skiing, you might make your reservations for Steamboat now with that big bullet of 3.1 inches of precip over the seven-day period. Uh, a little bit drier once you get away from the Rockies, from the Dakotas down to Kansas, just a little bit of moisture. But then as we move east, you can see those numbers really ramping up anywhere from a half an inch all the way up to this bullet of 1.6 over northern Michigan. Uh, so some good precept forecast over the next seven days uh, for the U.S. This is the 8 to 14 day outlook, which covers the period December 25th to December 31st, so it takes us right up to the end of the year. On the left, we have temperature. On the right, we have precipitation. So you can see a cold air intrusion coming in from the north here. Uh, high chances of below average temperatures over the Dakotas and much of the eastern U.S., all the way down much of the region and much of Colorado, except for our southwestern portion of the state, which has higher probabilities of being above average. So quite a gradient there through the midsection of the country. And in terms of precipitation, we've got higher chances of above average precipitation over much of the region as well. Um, so looking at that 8 to 14 day period here and expecting some good moisture to hopefully get some more snow on the ground and protect that winter wheat crop and help out the recreation industry. Just a bit of an El Nino update here. We are currently still in ENSO neutral conditions. Um, we have positive equatorial sea surface temperatures. Um, the anomalies are positive over much of the Pacific Ocean, excuse me, over the equatorial Pacific. And the current uh, Nino 3.4 region is what we look at for El Nino conditions, and you can see that anomaly is currently positive 0 0.9 degrees C. Uh, the cutoff for calling an El Nino is 0 0.5 degrees C, but I believe it has to be sustained for three months uh, to be able to actually call it El Nino instead of ENSO neutral conditions. Uh, this graphic here on the top is looking at the probability of a, an El Nino developing. So here in the November through January period, you can see we have about a 65% chance of an El Nino developing, and that would be present in the northern hemisphere uh, and hopefully last into the spring. The bottom plot here is showing uh, the plume of model predictions for ENSO conditions, and you can see they're all right currently, and this one is from October at 0 0.5, but they all Maybe go into a weak El Nino, uh, but nothing really strong on the horizon looking at the forecast currently. So this is the, the one month outlook taking into account um, all of the ENSO stuff and other model projections from the Climate Prediction Center. So this is the forecast for January 2015. What we see in terms of temperature over the region is chances of higher chances of below average temperature uh, from Nebraska south and east to Illinois equal chances of above or below um, temperatures for the rest of the region, except for eastern, or excuse me, western Wyoming and Colorado, which have those higher chances for warmer than average temperatures. In terms of precipitation, this looks very much like the El Nino uh, imprint with the, <coughs> we got equal chances of above or below average precipitation over much of the central region, but you see that dry in the Pacific Northwest, the wet over the southern portion of the U.S. Um, so a little bit uncertain, but we do have Kansas in there for chances of above average precipitation for January. This is the three-month outlook. So this is looking at January, February, and March 2015. Um, again, cooler than average temperatures, chances for cooler than average temperatures forecast over the southeastern portion of, of the central region, uh, equal chances for much of the rest of the region, a little bit warmer, chances for warmer than average temperatures as we move west. And in terms of precipitation for January, February, March, we see over the Great Lakes region those higher probabilities of below average precipitation, again, uh, El Nino signature, and then those wetter than normal conditions over the southwestern portion of the U.S., um, particularly Colorado, Nebraska, and Kansas fall into the, those higher chances. So that would be good to see since we've been in drought in those areas for quite a few years now. I seem to be frozen up here. Mm. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and... Mm. Okay, try to use my keyboard here. 
Uh, sorry about that. So this is the April through June uh, Climate Prediction Center outlook. You can see, again, temperature chances for warmer than average temperatures over the Great Lakes region, equal chances of above or below average temperatures elsewhere in the region. And then for precipitation, uh, much of the central region in those equal chances of above or below, except for uh, western Montana, Wyoming, and Colorado, which come into those higher than <laughs> higher chances of above average precipitation. This is the U.S. seasonal drought outlook, which was issued today. And pretty much what we see is the areas that are currently in drought are, are forecast to stay in drought um, through the March 31st period. Uh, the drought will persist or intensify in those regions. But no regions are really slated to develop drought um, at this point, looking at the seasonal drought outlook, which is good news. So just a, a brief summary of the recent conditions we went over. After that cold November, we've had warmer conditions in December, as well as dry conditions remaining uh, in December for the region, for much of the region. Uh, warm and dry weather has also allowed harvest to finish up, except for that corn crop like we talked about earlier in the webinar. Winter wheat conditions are looking OK on the west portion, but a little bit worse on the eastern portion that was really hit by that cold weather um, and the lack of protective snow cover at this point and damage from cold that may have occurred in November is, is still a concern. And then again, we have those impacts to winter recreation in the northern tier of the region uh, where we're lacking that snow cover currently. In the summary of the outlooks, there's a 65% chance of an El Nino conditions for the winter, and that will hopefully persist into the spring. Uh, cooler weather forecast for the end of this month and into the beginning of January based off uh, the about three to four week models. And then in those three month outlooks, we really start to see those El Nino signatures pop up uh, with the cool weather across the southern U.S., wet in the southwest U.S., and then dry over the Great Lakes region. So with that, here's some more information about our partners and uh, web links to their organizations. And I will take any questions at this point if anyone has them. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, for Wendy or anyone, uh, Paul Lepister with the Isaac Walton League. On last month's update, El the El Nino seemed to be weakening. And um, I, I think that uh, there was some talk that it wouldn't have much impact or influence on weather in the upper Midwest this winter. Has it starting? Has that turned around and is starting to strengthen, or why is this outlook a little bit different than what we were listening to a month ago? When do you want me to answer it, or would you like to? I would, if you would, since you were on the webinar earlier this week about the CPC forecast. Or anybody else. As for I, I'm not, I'm no expert either. But um, <laughs> yeah, so there was an uptick uh, around the beginning of uh, the month of December that really showed that. Uh, uh, perhaps the El Nino was going to be coming back, um, and so they upped it from I think 57 or 58 or whatever it was up to 65, back to 65 percent uh, chance of occurring. Still means there's a 35 percent chance it won't. So um, I think a couple things. Uh, that uncertainty there shows that number one, no matter what happens, it's going to be a relatively weak El Nino, and when you have relatively weak El Ninos. Uh, they become, I'm not going to say meaningless because they're not, but they, they become uh, more e easily overshadowed by a number of other, uh, let's just say, climate uh, indexes that we look at, um, things like the uh, Arctic Oscillation or the uh, North Atlantic Oscillation, which, which you may not know what that is, but, but those, are, those can impact things a lot more than um, the El Nino. So El Nino is part of the game, but it's a... Uh, uh, sort of a minor one at this point, if that helps at all. Uh, so, so it does depend on how strong the El Nino is, and this is a weak one, if it, if it even forms or is uh, substantiated. And it also depends on if the atmosphere sort of reflects uh, the ocean, and sometimes that's a stretch too. So um, I welcome anybody else's comments. Yeah, this, this, oh, this is Dennis. Dennis Toddy. Um, there was a great deal of conversation earlier this week in, in the Outlook discussion about what was going to happen. And, and it's very clear that the, the forecasters are, are, are picking parts of El Nino, the El Nino impacts that they think are going to show up, and they have shown up in some of the Outlooks. 
that there are parts of those outlooks that look kind of El Nino-ish. But for us, you know, even as we will probably end up crossing over into El Nino territory, it is going to be very weak. And Doug is right. There are a number of other things probably going to play in on this that really weakens the overall impact of it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any other questions? Not today. Okay, great. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for joining us, and uh, wish you all a safe and sober holiday season. And uh, we'll see you next year on January 15th. Take care now. Bye-bye. Thank you.